in times of great duress, people really gravitate to the arts. I think it's a real value that, um, that the arts have. Just the commitment that was clear from the university to invest in the arts in such a meaningful way. When students really take ownership of the space, yeah. they're gonna bring in a cohort that's you know really there to support them. And been absolutely blown away. But all of the spaces within the building are really custom designed. Kind of experienced a renaissance of the arts here on campus. I mean, when I first got here, I felt like we were on an island. This is the final brick in the foundation of right. DPAC. What are you just most excited about? Students know Broadway in a way that they never used to. Be one of the biggest seasons we've ever hosted. So okay. I'll tease you on that. So you're killing me here. The suspense is the <laughs> only... From the campus of Our Ladies University, this is For Good, Stories from Notre Dame, a behind-the-scenes glimpse into life under the Golden Dome and the powerful stories that drive Notre Dame to become a force for good in the world. Hello and welcome to For Good, Stories from Notre Dame. We're coming to you today from the Patricia George DCO Theater, a beautiful venue one of six state-of-the-art venues housed within the DeBartolo Performing Arts Center. Today, I'm joined by Ted Barron, the Executive Director of the DeBartolo Performing Arts Center and the Judd and Mary Lou Layton Director of the Performing Arts at Notre Dame. Ted, thanks so much for joining us today. Really excited about our discussion. So let's, let's start by this backdrop. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. We, we've come recently uh, to our viewers from the head football coach's office mm -hmm. in the Goog, a magnificent space uh, in the McCourtney Hall for interdisciplinary research, yep. terrific space, but nothing tops this. Now we're literally on stage. We're on stage. <laughs> this is about given, what a better place for us, right? That's right. Given my um, limited talents, this is the <laughs> only way I'm going to make it up here in the stage. So, so um, tell us a little bit about uh, the the DCO Theater here sure. and the other five venues. And, and how you use them and, and how they're distinct. Well, we're very fortunate, um, you know, for a, a university like Notre Dame to have made the investment in such incredible um, spaces that are really designed to kind of highlight the arts in a way that is designed to serve the needs of individual art forms. So right now we're in the Patricia George DCO Theater, which is our main stage theater. Uh, this is primarily the home of, of um, arts such as dance and theater mm -hmm. that we present here uh, at the Performing Arts Center on a regular basis. Uh, we bring in visiting dance companies. Um, we have our students who perform uh, as part of the film, television, and theater program. Mm -hmm. We have the Shakespeare at Notre Dame program, which mounts an amazing production here every every year. Um, this space is 350 seats. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, fully rigged. So for anybody that's coming in with a, a production that's sort of already ready to go, they can just plug right into the space and take full advantage of the design of it. Um, so is it the depth of the stage that, that allows for these theatrical performances as well as dance? That's, yeah, that's a factor within mm -hmm. it. it um, for dance, we have a sprung floor, so that's an ideal situation uh, for dancers. Um, thankfully, we have um, a cover on this area of our uh, stage right now, which is where our orchestra pit would be. So if we had, if we were mounting a musical, which okay. has become a bigger thing within our film, television, and theater program, right. we can have uh, musicians performing uh, within the space. Um, but the other thing about the space is, is just, you know, that you have wings where um, you can have really a full crew ready to go to support the performance. So that's just this one space right, right. Um, where, you know, we have five other spaces, as you note. Um, we have uh, the uh, Reyes Organ and Choral Hall, uh, which is a magnificent space, probably one of our smaller spaces within the building um, that has its own custom designed organ mm -hmm. uh, that was built at the time the center opened in 2004. Um, and that's been a really great asset to our sacred music program in particular, right. where we have Which students. Is one of the strongest in the country. Exactly. Yeah. And very quickly became so. I mean, right. you would think Notre Dame and sacred music, obvious fit, right? But right. it's actually, as a graduate program, it's only existed for a relatively short time. Right. Um, so we have, yeah, we have master's students. We have doctoral students who regularly practice and perform uh, within that space. Uh, we also bring in visiting organists as well. It's a really stunning space that I think people overlook yeah. because it's, you know, it's such a specialized right. uh, type of performance that we do within it. 
Uh, we have the Philbin Studio Theater, which is our black box space. Uh, we know who that's named for, Regis Philbin. We should call it the Reg. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just in memory to the great Regis Philbin. Yeah. But um, that's become a really exciting space, uh, particularly for students in our theater concentration who um, develop their own productions through uh, through the program. Uh, it's a black box theater, mm -hmm. so which also can be referred to as an experimental mm -hmm. uh, theater. And not so much that it's the content that's experimental, but it's um, if we think about it as a kind of laboratory where students can really try out uh, different approaches to theater, that space is is ideally designed for it, right. um, and that seats up to about a hundred people. Mm -hmm. um, and you can reconfigure the seating, however, right? You can yeah, theater in the round. You can have it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There was one production they did a few years ago uh, where it was all set within an apartment, and they had built walls so that you were peering through the windows, and it had a sort of oh. voyeuristic yeah. tone to it already. But that just that just emphasized it even further. It was a really clever choice. Um, but then you can do something even grander scale. Um, they did a production of um, the, um, oh, I'm forgetting his name, Cyrano de Bergerac. Oh, yeah. Uh, where they actually built uh, a full a full uh, scale um, staging where they could do uh, sword play and all sorts of great uh, things within the space. Okay. So it really encourages different kinds of setups within the space. Carmen and I have come with the kids uh, to a few of those student productions. Yeah. And been absolutely blown away. Yeah. And, well, and, and it just, I mean, just, and it's hard yeah. to get tickets. They're, they're in because, a yeah, because, yeah. well, partly this, you know, the size of the space, it, it right. just creates that much more demand. But, um, but I think particularly because when students really take ownership of the space, yeah. they're going to bring in a cohort, uh, mm -hmm. an audience that's, that's, you know, really there to support them. Um, we have our cinema space, which is a particular fondness to me, given my interests. Uh, you know, I was originally hired to run the cinema program right. here uh, at DPAC. And um, that's been a remarkable space, uh, not only in terms of what we do publicly, but how it gets used as a teaching space. Mm -hmm. It's a 200 seat theater um, that has a THX sound system. Uh, whenever we bring in visiting filmmakers, the first things that they the first thing that they will tell us once we you know start running their film is I've never heard a film sound this good before. Yeah. Um, so it's really uh, a special. The thing THX about that. technology is still state of the art. It's still yeah, it still is. I mean, yeah. we've made some tweaks to it. We've right. made some upgrades, but um, and we're actually looking to do an even bigger upgrade mm -hmm. with some of the equipment within the space. But um, for now, it's actually working great. Yeah. Um, but we and we actually still have the ability to present film digitally or also on on film, mm -hmm. uh, which gives us a lot of options if we ever wanted to do something archival uh, within it. the space. But um, it's also in addition to all of the films that we do that we screen there because we show films every weekend, kind of kind of like your local art house cinema. Um, we also present uh, uh, programs from the National Theatre in London. So you mm -hmm. can actually see um, theater presented on screen. And even though, you know, it's not like watching it on television because right. that immersiveness that that space encourages really puts you at the center of the production. And then the Met Opera has been a big, right. uh, a big component of that. Um, so then that brings and us don't to... Don't you do also the hundred top films Ever so we been? have a list of, uh, we made, a, this was a program we set up uh, several years ago. It actually predated my arrival of uh, the top 100. We came up with a list of top 100 films we consulted with faculty and other scholars about, you know, what are the films that we think should be prioritized yeah. within the cinema program? So we still, we have that posted up on our website. That leaves, um, well, we have two, we have a couple of other, we have two other spaces to mention. One is our Pinot Performers Hall, which um, we used to use more for um, kind of Friday afternoon music performances. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get used quite in that way now because we have the amazing O'Neill Hall of Music right. that's taken on a lot of those performances. Um, now it's now it's a really great support space for um, for another venue, which I'll get to. Um, but it gets used very regularly as a rehearsal space for uh, the Notre Dame Glee Club, mm -hmm. Notre Dame Symphony, who just Notre Dame Symphony needs, needs a lot of room to right, right. Uh, you know have their uh, the different members of the ensemble prepare for their performances. It's also used a lot now with the uh, with the musical theater uh, program kind of building up. Uh, there's a production of um, a chorus line that's mm. in development right now. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a lot of kids singing and dancing yeah. within that space. Um, and we've opened it up. That's also been an avenue to open up space for our community uh, yeah. outreach. So we do work with a company called Uzima, who's a drum and dance company based okay. here in South Bend. And they actually use the space for rehearsals oh, on a weekly basis. So that brings us to the big space, which is the um, Layton Concert Hall, right. which, you know, if, if you're, you know, if you have to choose, if you're here 
here for a limited time, that's probably the space that you want to visit. Um, it's a 900 seat concert hall. Yeah. Um, it has a fully adjustable acoustic system. So uh, one of the advantages of that is we can really custom design mm -hmm. uh, the acoustics within the space so that it meets the needs of the uh, visiting artists. So if we're presenting a jazz company, they might have different needs from, uh, say, a, a symphony that's coming. Right. Um, when we had Todd Rundgren here, that was mm -hmm. you know, that was a rock show that has you know that has a very different tenor to it. Um, but we can really customize that. And then that also is a great space. Uh, it's, it's really the preferred space for many of the VIP speakers who come to campus. Right. So you think about, you know, we've had a lot of the Supreme Court justices right. come and give talks. Um, we've had uh, John Kerry and Condoleezza Rice do this amazing uh, program on foreign policy right. uh, within the space. Uh, Rita Moreno mm -hmm. uh, was featured there uh, a few years ago. So it's a really nice uh, uh, space for all of that. But um, but just when you walk into the space, you kind of see the grandeur of, yeah. you know, this is really intentional uh, in terms of how we want to present the arts. And I mentioned, you know, the acoustics being adjustable, the system where you can kind of uh, you can make adjustments to the way panels are um, kind of hung within the space right. during performances. But all of the spaces within the building are really custom designed so that the, the acoustics match what's intended to be presented within here, right. within, within those spaces. So right. this space we're in right now is actually really great for the spoken word. So it's good that we're having a conversation within right. this space because it's designed um, for you to hear live theater uh, right. being presented. Whereas the cinema space, you only want to hear what's coming out of those speakers yeah. from the THX sound system. So that's a much deader space in comparison. The organ hall, much more of a live space so yeah. that it, you really get that full effect of the organ. So now, is it urban legend or is it true that when this building was built, the DeBartolo Performing Arts Center, mm -hmm. that these different venues within, the six different venues and some of the other spaces, there is not a wire, a pipe that goes from one building that connects to the others to keep each space acoustically pure. Now, I've heard like the backstage here, yeah that they could have a chainsaw yeah. going on backstage here and you would not hear it in the theater. Now, is this urban? Well, I mean, it might be slightly embellished, but I mean, <laughs> but, but there is, the, the, all of the venues were built on separate foundations. Okay. And that was in, in part to kind of contain acoustics um, within spaces. I will say, you know, as we, as technology is advancing, we're probably going to need to have more connectivity between those spaces. Okay. If you think about, you know, one of the projects that we have out there is to, uh, is to have a streaming content program. Mm -hmm. We want to have more flexibility to sort of, to be able to, um, you know, have to be able to cut back and forth between, between yeah. those spaces. So, you know, in terms of, you know, being fully cut off from one another, yeah. I don't know if that's the current state of affairs, but definitely in the original design, yeah. it was, you know, it was set up so that, you know, once you're in that space, you're not supposed to be hearing that jackhammer or, right. you know, the kids at the playground or whatever it might be. No, I do. Happening outside I did hear that, um, again, um, correct me because I can be prone to hyperbole, <laughs> the, the work that I do, but it is that, that when the New York Philharmonic, the yeah. first time, the first year that it was open, yeah. 20 years ago, came here and performed in the Leighton Concert Hall, that the maestro, the conductor, yeah. said that it was one of the more acoustically pure places that he's, they've ever performed. I, I never heard that it was that it was uh, the New York Phil who were a key part of that first season that we hosted. I've heard that Itzhak Perlman said that. Oh, actually. Itzhak Perlman. Yeah, who was here twice, actually, because we hosted him about five years ago. Okay. Um, but that's... Yeah, that's been a quote that we drop during our tours on yeah. a regular basis because Itzhak Perlman's a pretty good, you know, right. it's a pretty good celebrity endorsement to yeah. have for your space. That's so. fantastic. So yeah. how do you think this space on the Notre Dame campus stacks up to other universities, especially other yeah. top universities? Yeah, I mean, most of my past experience was in and around the Boston area. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Boston's an old city. And so yeah. you have a lot of old buildings and buildings that kind of get custom, you know, retrofit to try to meet current needs. And there's always limitations of that. But what I what I've noticed more uh, directly is that, you know, you have your larger universities. You know, you think about your big state schools like Purdue, Michigan, um, you know, go into like Florida or Georgia. They have major performing arts centers. They're also in much larger communities. I mean, yeah. South Bend's a community of 100,000 people or so. Um, you know, they, those those places are situated in places where, you know, you have a much bigger local population. Right. Um, so we're kind of 
in comp, it, well, not in competition, but we're kind of on par with those, um, those kinds of performing arts centers, as opposed to what you see at most universities, big city or small city, which is, you know, a university says, oh, come to our performing arts center. And essentially you're getting one space. Right. That has to be kind of an end all be all for everything arts related that happens. Mm -hmm. So it was really, I mean, I wasn't around during the design phase, but it was a really wise decision to make the investment in having these separate spaces so that the students in particular that use them really develop, uh, you know, specialty and, and, um, you know, they, they're able to, to thrive in their particular art form yeah. in part because of the space that they're able to use that, um, that helps to support that. And, and it looks like, it still looks like it's brand new. I mean, it's 20 years ago, the facility has been, you know, kept up just beautifully. Yeah. But you were kind of the first on the horizon, the DeBartolo Performing Arts Center. And since then, we've really, in my estimation, kind of experienced a renaissance of the arts here on campus. Right. And some of it we can point to by the new buildings, the O'Neill Hall of Music, mm -hmm. which is at the south end of the, the Notre Dame football stadium, a, a beautiful structure. Yeah. Um, and then, then we also built the Walsh Hall our family, Walsh Family Hall of Architecture. Right, right. Next and door. then, um, right, most recently, the Racklin Murphy Museum of Art, which is a spectacular so new nice. visual so arts facility. Yeah. How are, are you beginning to collaborate with the other different groups that, that focus on different versions of the arts? And are we, is there a future plan for Absolutely. greater collaboration? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So we've been, I mean, there, a few of us have been talking at least for five years now mm -hmm. about the idea of, you know, what we were originally calling an arts district. Mm -hmm. uh, it sort of evolved into this concept of an arts gateway. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an intentional term that we use because we want there to be this idea that it's a kind of, as much as the district idea was about this proximity that was very fortuitous of having these buildings, you know, constructed so close to where we were. I mean, when I first got here in 2010, I felt like we were on an island because, yeah. um, you know, just the there weren't a lot of buildings close by. And to go to meetings or anything on campus, it was quite a trek. And now there's been so much that's filled in on the campus toward us right. um, that you just we feel much more connected. Mm -hmm. um, but anticipating kind of that physical proximity we realized that, you know, it wasn't just enough to keep advocating for more and more stuff to be built around us, mm -hmm. that we had to make stuff happen within those spaces right. that was more um, that was more collaborative. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that those conversations really started in, uh, you know, in a robust way in 2019, mm -hmm. soon to be disrupted by the pandemic. Um, ultimately, the pandemic actually created an opportunity to kind of build up these plans even further. Mm -hmm. um, we, we had a series, there were a series of uh, uh, meetings that we had to talk about kind of a vision for the arts as we, you know, as we were fully confident we would come back from the pandemic and get back to doing what we do well. Um, and one of the programs that I'm really proud of is a campaign that, um, that our marketing team initiated during the 2020, 2021 year, which was the year in which, um, we couldn't present anything. Right. We had to essentially, um, well, we didn't have to, but we offered to turn our spaces over to the academy so that right. you could have, you know, socially distanced classrooms, right. and, which, you know, this is great for, you know, when we were thinking about that six feet of distance right. between each other, we have, you know, we had space to do that. So we we're really uh, grateful to be able to, you know, kind of contribute to the university's yeah. effort to stay open. To stay open yeah. um, but um, within that year, we, uh, our marketing team created a campaign called State of the Art. Mm -hmm. And what they did is, you know, kind of consulted with all of the different units that you're talking about, yeah. architecture, um, art, art, history and design, music, sacred music. Um, uh, what's then the Snipe Museum, now the Racklin Murphy Museum. Right. Um, and try to find out what were people doing? Mm -hmm. to continue to be kind of represented. And there was a lot, particularly with the academic programs, you had a lot of students who were um, performing in kind of digital context. So you think mm -hmm. about a recital, there were recitals that were happening in the concert hall. They just didn't have anybody in the audience. Right. So those were being filmed and then streamed online. Oh. And so we built together, we, we put together all of these different things that were happening. It was happening with, you know, art shows as well, where they right. kind of created YouTube versions of what would, you know, in other circumstances, be right. an in-person art show. 
and highlighted those over, a, a, it was about a three or four week period where each week we pushed out different content that was happening. Um, and so that was really exciting because I think that spoke to a project that I've been really passionate about, which is to establish a regular arts festival here on campus. Got it. Um, and that's, that's one of the plans that we, and I can tell you a little bit more about that, but that's one of the plans that we have kind of going forward with, in terms of working together with those different units. So, so tell us a little bit about these, these got these wonderful venues. You talked mm-hmm. a little bit about programming. Tell us what are some of the programs that have just really jumped off the page for you? Yeah. When you look back on your tenure here, yeah. what are you just most excited about? Wow. We had so-and-so here and right. Yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of, you know, if we want to name drop, yeah, <laughs> we've yeah, got a few, we we we've got a few, okay, good. Um, but you know, I think, I think we made a turn toward, um, toward Broadway artists that was really successful. Yeah. Um, and, and, and some within the industry said, well, you know, you might want to be a little more cautious about that. Patty Lapone was one of the first ones. They said, you know, Patty Lapone, you know, she's, she's a bit further along in her career. I don't know that she's going to have uh, the same level of interest as she would have had, you know, 10, 20 years ago, sold out performance. Mm. I mean, just in, and people were over the moon to see her on yeah. stage, but that led to a run where we had, you know, Kristen Chenoweth, we had Leslie yeah. Odom Jr., Renee Lee Goldsberry, a couple of Hamilton folks. Um, we had Matthew Morrison, um, just a really um, exciting run of these Broadway artists, which those performances I always have a soft spot for because um, they were particularly of interest to our students. Mm-hmm. Um, students know Broadway in a way that they never used to. Yeah. Uh, they're just they're, the level of fandom for Broadway is off the charts or it has been for the last few yeah. years. So, so I think what was interesting is when we would run the numbers on those shows, we would see a much higher percentage of student tickets sold wow. than what we had seen before. Um, you know, I think I, I, I'm a big fan of our jazz programming that we do. Um, and in part because we found a way to connect with, um, the Notre Dame, uh, jazz, uh, the, the music programs, mm-hmm. jazz ensembles, and in particular, the collegiate jazz competition that they host every year. Yeah. So we've actually been able to line up so that our visiting artists that we bring in for the, for the ja- for our jazz component of our, um, uh, visiting artist series, they actually serve as clinicians mm-hmm. for the ja- for the collegiate jazz festival. So they're working directly with the students. They're giving them feedback, right. they're, you know, helping them to become better artists. Um, and then more recently, something that I, I really I really feel like was the right move for us um, is we've done a program called Cultural Collective, which is a series that focuses on local artists. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think as much, and that's why, you know, when we, I, I was sort of joking about the name dropping is, you know, we should be dropping these names because right. these are the, these are the folks that have been part of our community, active as artists, really feeding uh, this greater region as a place to appreciate and celebrate the arts. Right. Um, and so, uh, so the fact that we've been able to highlight um, some really interesting artists and to have it re- and, and have an incredibly enthusiastic response, yeah. those artists, I think, uh, have been really key in bringing in audiences yeah. that maybe didn't feel welcome. So, so you're about to celebrate the 20th anniversary. We are. Um, of the... Is this commonly referred to around here? The DPAC. The DPAC. The, or the the interestingly, locally, people call it the DeBartolo. We've been oh, hearing that. We really? go, I go in meetings more and more, and they say, oh, this is happening at the DeBartolo. And it's like, that would never work on campus. So that's because, because the you students, get the mix up of the, the students don't want to mix up the, the DeBartolo spaces. But. That is hilarious. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Um, so, so what are some that you can share with us? Yeah. I don't think it's been released yet, but it hasn't, but, but what, I'll tell you, what are some of the kind of the, the premier series that yeah. you're going to really focus on this coming year? How, what can people get excited about? Well, I mean, the date to save is September 19th, 2024, because that's officially our 20th anniversary from when we first opened and we hosted uh, Wynton Marsalis and uh, Jazz from Lincoln Center. Wow. A really great event, which I was not, but were you yeah, at that? I was there. Yeah. I was yeah. there. Amazing. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, so we're going to, we're going to celebrate that milestone. Check out all these, all these gray hairs <laughs> represent the fact I'm that I was up there. With you at this point. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so, uh, so w- for that, I mean, we really want to give thanks to everybody who supported us um, in getting us to this 20th anniversary right. milestone. Um, a colleague of mine said, you know, this is the final brick in the foundation of right. DPAC. If you think about, you know, us, we're no longer this kind of emerging space or the space that really has to prove itself. We're, we're you know, I think 
people now think about Notre Dame or think about us relative to Notre Dame as we're here and we're here to stay. That's right. Um, and we wouldn't be here to stay if people hadn't supported us so generously over the right. years with their patronage, you know, being showing up at performances, right. um, taking chances on things that maybe were, you know, out of left field or they weren't as familiar with. Okay, so you're, you're killing me here. The suspense is still okay, building. I know, I know, I, mean, I know. This okay. is, this is the way you, but this is okay, how you good. get excited. How, okay, it's good. the build okay, good. up. It's good. the build up. Um, so we, um, so that event is going to be, is going to draw from our cultural collective artists. Okay. So if I drop names, they're, they're not going to be as familiar and we're still yeah. sorting out who that's going to be. Sure. But, but the idea is to make that, Welcome to everyone from campus as well as from our greater community. And Which is great because in this strategic framework, yeah. we focus for the first time ever really on South Bend, Indiana. So yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, which that is, you guys are a key link between Notre Dame and the local community. As I well. mean, that was why, wasn't that why we were right. built where we were to right. be this point of connection with the right. greater community? So then we get into a season that's going to be one of the biggest seasons we've ever hosted. So we'll have more artists than we normally do. Uh, uh, I mentioned uh, Wynton Marsalis and Jazz from Lincoln Center. Uh, he's coming back, um, and we're really excited for that. Uh, we're going to have uh, the London Philharmonic, wow. um, uh, who will be performing. Um, they were here wow. in 2008, I think. Okay. So, you know, part of it, part of the idea is to look back at some of our biggest, right. uh, you know, biggest performances from the past, some of our most acclaimed performances, yeah. so, you know, performances that get really excited. You asked before about, you know, what were the performances that get me excited? Whenever we host the symphony, it's like, you know, yeah. you feel like the roof is coming off right. the building. I mean, it's just right. in the best way possible. Yeah. Not that, you know, we don't want, you know, facility problems. Yeah. But, um, but no, I mean, literally feeling that just the, the yeah. swell of music within the space, that's just, that's just going to be something extraordinary. Um, and we're also in talks with um, Nathan Gunn, a uh, South Bend uh, artist who's, you know, gone on to big success within the field of opera uh, to have him come back as part of the program and hopefully with a very special guest to be announced soon. Okay. So I'll tease you on that. Okay, I, good. We, we won't drop that name just okay, yet. Good. Um, but, um, but the idea is to kind of, you know, again, build on those past uh, successes and, uh, and really look toward the future of, you know, if we're going to, if, if we're going to have the impact that we want to have, um, we have to think about kind of different components to our program. Right. So we want to have those big names that draw people in, that get people excited. Mm -hmm. Um, it, you know, in, 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 for, in a lot of cases, give people a chance to try out, you know, right. the center and kind of see what it is that we have to offer. Um, we also are very intentional about making connections uh, with campus yeah. uh, through our programming. So, you know, our presenting series, you know, which is our series of visiting artists, we have uh, a, a tier within that program that I would say is very focused on uh, things that are either brought to us uh, from members of the academy or opportunities that we find where we kind of go mm -hmm. out and make uh, make meaningful connections. Uh, something that's been really successful for us is um, our chamber music series, hmm. which is you know smaller ensembles performing as chamber music uh, is known to be. Um, but we actually present those. We do those. We present those events in collaboration with the Department of Music, and we actually present them at O'Neill Hall of Music. So we go oh, okay. outside of our space. Got it. Um, but the idea is that, you know, the pro, you know, as much as, you know, we're so right. grateful for what this building is and what it can do, right. uh, we also want to look to those opportunities outside. So, so my understanding is too, that you'll oftentimes, as opposed to just a place that in most cities, uh, you know, yeah. nice venues that bring in an artist, they come in and they perform. Don't you also try to bring in many of these artists and ask them to stay beyond their performance yep. and interact with our students. Can you give some examples of, sure. of how that's worked? Yeah. So the chamber music series is a great example of that because, um, you know, we'll typically bring in, um, you know, a string ensembles and they'll work with students who are studying violin or cello. Right. Uh, so they'll have their performance and literally stay after the show. Yeah. And students will come. If the students weren't already in attendance, you know, they'll show up and then they'll work one on one uh, wow. with individual students. Um, we also see that a lot with our dance companies mm -hmm. uh, that we bring to campus. So um, the dance companies, uh, it works really nicely where they're typically here in residence for a few right. days because it just takes more time to mount those productions. 
Um, and so they have extra time where they can go out. Um, they've done a lot of work at St. Mary's College because St. Mary's actually has a dance major. Right. Um, there's more interest coming from Notre Dame because of the musical theater minor. Mm -hmm. um, but to have those dancers kind of connect with the students and teach them technique mm -hmm. uh, is a big part of it. And then they'll also go out into the greater community and work with our local high schools. Right. So in South Bend, we have a performing arts magnet school. Um, we regularly send dancers out to, to, you know, work with those students, which I feel is really important because, you know, it's a lot of kids who need to know yeah. what opportunities exist for them. Talk a little bit about Todd Rundgren, the uh, kind of contemporary yeah. musician. What, what, what did he do when he was here? So he was here while? twice. Um, and, uh, it was a really amazing, uh, series of events. He's a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. So that's why I'm laughing because yeah. he had, uh, I think he had his own private golf cart while he was here that, yeah. uh, that, you know, kind of shepherded him around campus. But he, um, Ted Mandel, a colleague uh, who teaches in the Department of Film, Television and Theater, had the idea of, you know, let's bring Todd in. Let's get him to talk about um, his work in the music industry. He's not only a great performer in his own right, but he's a producer, uh, you know, extraordinaire. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's produced so many different mm -hmm. artists over the years. Um, and so he actually did a one credit class where he was uh, he taught for a week. And then he um, he performed on stage, but what he did it two different ways. The first time he performed, he brought his own band and he invited different um, students from campus, from different ensembles to kind of serve as backup. Um, I remember Alex Mansour, one of our great alums, uh, yeah. real piano wizard, and although he's actually a, ch a cellist by, uh, by training. Um, he, um, he actually performed on stage with Todd for one of his shows. The second time he came back, he actually let the students kind of take center stage and he and the, he and his band were the backup wow. uh, performers. So, um, and that was when we had a really strong cohort in our musical theater program. So kids with just these, you know, incredible voices right. all performing on stage together. Um, another piece I don't want to lose sight of relative to Todd's visit is that, you know, and a big part of why we made the commitment to have him here as long as he was is that um, he has a foundation called Spirit of Harmony, mm -hmm. which um, which focuses on music education. Right. So they were organizing instrument drives, for example, mm -hmm. for local schools, so we could get mm -hmm. um, instruments sent out to to schools that really need them, and right. just again help young people to develop um, as musicians, right. or even you know just to have the experience of music right. in the curriculum, which is you know, becoming increasingly harder to do. So you mentioned the partnership with the film, television, and theater yeah. major within the College of Arts and Letters, and many of them are housed. Do they have yeah. uh, classrooms and, and offices here in the building, especially in the lower level? Um, what might be some of the partnerships that you have on campus and beyond that people wouldn't imagine? Right. Yeah. Uh, so you can imagine the theater yeah. department. You can imagine right. the music department. Um, we do some interesting things with, um, so a lot of the centers and institutes on campus, particularly mm -hmm. those that are kind of, that are more um, uh, foreign policy based, um, yeah. there's, there's a surprising number of connections that we make with um, folks like the Nanovic Institute for European Studies. Um, going back to when I was programming the cinema, we did, we had a great film series that we ran uh, for, for a long, long time. And what's also great about, you know, working with folks at the Nanovic is we can do things um, almost more spontaneously. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, you know, the tragedy of the war in Ukraine broke mm -hmm. out, uh, we were able to kind of make adjustments within our program to respond to that. And we right. actually had a, a, a semester long uh, film series that that spoke to the Ukrainian experience. Wow. Um, that's that's, that's been great. The Lou Institute mm -hmm. uh, for Asian Studies, um, they've been uh, they've been a great supporter of our programming. We've found some really nice points of connection. This week, we're actually hosting a, a concert that's being put on by the Italian Studies Program. Right. Um, and so, you know, I mean, and, and with the international, anything that has a kind of international focus, right. um, there's some obvious connections with the arts. Um, but it's nice when we can go outside of it. When we when we had the uh, ensemble Third Coast Percussion, mm -hmm. they were in residence with us for several years. Um, they actually worked with um, our engineering program um, because a big uh, component of their work was designing instruments. So they actually have a curriculum that came out of their residency with us, which was uh, which design which they worked with engineering students right. to design instruments that were used in schools. So just a couple closing questions. Um, when I graduated from Notre Dame, I went and 
lived for a couple of years in a shanty town in Santiago, Chile. It was under the dictatorship there. And one of the things that was eye-opening for me was in times of great duress and suffering, people really gravitate to the arts. Street poetry, yeah. music, theater, all of these things you know, were what people looked to to help survive. With all the chaos, the noise in our society today, the political divisiveness and rancor, do you feel that this is a time that more people are coming to the arts? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 in, I can, and, and particularly in those times where it's even more stressful, because yeah. I, I can remember, you know, particular points, you know, whether it was after an election that people were very divided about or, right. you know, other, you know, crazy events that have gone on over the past several years. I can remember introducing an event on stage. It was a dance company. Um, it might've been Complexion's uh, ballet company. And it was right after one of those moments. And, you know, I just sort of took the moment to say, it's so, we're so grateful to have so many people here, whatever you believe, whatever your, you know, whatever your background is, we hope that you can find something that, you know, just sort of connects us at a right. time when we're not, be, we're not very connected as people. Right. And I think it's a real value that, um, that the arts have, um, you know, not only here at Notre Dame, but just in the world in general. So it's great to hear you connect that to your own personal experience. I think so very true. Final question is that, you know, what, what, what is your why? Why did you gravitate to film in the mm -hmm. first place? And then ultimately into this really important leadership role for the performing arts at Notre Dame. Yeah, well, film, I would say, for me, it was a way to understand the world in a meaningful way. I mean, I, I think I've settled into, I teach classes through the Department of Film, Television, and Theater. And I think the most rewarding classes are the ones when I'm teaching something that's less familiar. Right. Um, and in particular, that, that often gets framed through a kind of global perspective. So I teach a global cinema course on a semi-regular basis. Mm -hmm. And I'm constantly tweaking that syllabus. So, you know, let's see what the experience is like in South Africa. Let's see what it's like in uh, Taiwan. Let's, you know, let's look at parts of the world that, you know, we might hear about in the news, but right. film can really kind of bring us into those experiences right. um, in a meaningful way. Um, you know, what gets me out of bed, I think, in, into this role, which I'm very grateful for, um, is I think back to when I first arrived on campus and I walked through the doors of this lobby. How long into ago this was that? That was in 2010. Okay. Um, and just blown away by the quality of the space, mm -hmm. you know, just the, and, and, you know, just the commitment that was clear from the university to invest in the arts in such a meaningful way that spoke that, that just, that, that said a lot. Right. But what was even more meaningful as I kind of went through my, you know, first uh, kind of in real encounter with campus were the people mm -hmm. um, and just thinking about, you know, I had a very settled life in another part of the country I could see myself um, here and here for a long time, particularly because of the people that I get to that I get to work with, um, the artists that we get to meet on a regular basis. Um, it's just a really special place. And I'm just I'm just grateful. Well, I think in, uh, in the Catholic faith, we we call the Pope the Pontifex, which comes from Ponte, which means bridge. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, the, the Pope for us is the bridge builder between the between God and 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 us the yeah. people, and you're bridge builder here at Notre Dame, and you do it so beautifully um, between the the university and the community, between the Performing Arts Center and so many of the different departments, between our faculty and our students. So thank you for the the good person that you are and the outstanding job that you do in bringing us all together. I really appreciate that. Around the thank arts. you very much. So we always close these sessions uh, with a prayer to Our Lady. And so wherever you are, please uh, join us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Thanks again so much, Ted. Take care, God bless, and go Irish.